Blessed are those who dwell in your house. God, we receive that promise for us today. And God, I also want to speak blessings for those who trust in you for strength today, who lean not on our own understanding. And God, we wait for you to come and bring deliverance. We wait for you to come and bring freedom for the oppressed. We wait for you to come and bring true healing and liberation for North Korea. And we come gather together to encounter the living God, to honor your presence here with hearts attentive, to hear your word with hearts expressive in our praises, in our prayers to you. And we've gathered together because we want our lives to be changed by the power of the word. So Father, as Your people gather in your name. I ask that you would release your spirit's presence to move in a mighty way, saving lives who have yet to know you today and refreshing hearts to long for more of you. And Father, I ask that you would strengthen me now. Fill me with your spirit and Holy Spirit. I invite you to preach through me today so that all that I do, all that I think, all that I say, all that I want, all that I desire, all the motives of my heart bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, I ask that no life would leave here the same, that we would have a deep, intimate encounter with the living God through his living word today. So come, Holy Spirit, accomplish the mighty purposes of your kingdom in our hearts, in this place. of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And it is in that precious name we pray. Amen. You know, there is something about love that causes us to give. And actually, maybe I will share the story of my toe right now because I think it may kind of fit. So this past Monday, um, Uh, my, it's my day off, and so I usually try to spend the day with my son Enoch, my two-and-a-half-year-old son. And uh, the phase that he's in these days is he loves helicopters. And so whenever he hears a helicopter, uh, we'll run to the window, or if we're outside, we'll try to look for it, but usually if we're inside, he'll run to the window and try to find it. He calls helicopters helis. So, heli, heli, where are you? you know? And so um, last Monday, um, I was holding him, And all of a sudden, we heard the helicopter. And then, you know, he points me to the window. It's like, take me, Daddy, you know, because I'm his chauffeur as well. And so, uh, but the past few times that we went to the window, he missed it. And so, but usually also when we see it, it'll just be for like a second, you know, and then it goes. Uh, but I really wanted him to see it. And so I still remember a split second wondering, do I drop him to the ground and pat him on the butt and say, run to the window? Or do I rush over to the window? And so I decided in that split second, I'm going to run, even though I'm holding it. So I ran to the window, but while I did that, uh, my pinky toe uh, hit the slide, and it broke out this way. So suddenly my pinky toe was like, I was like, oh. I was like, oh. <laughs> you know? But still, we were at the window. Do you see it? I was like, do you see it? And the reason why I broke is just out of my love for my son. I wanted him to see a helicopter, even if it was for one second, at the cost of my toll, which will leave me on crutches again for the next three to four weeks. But maybe sooner because you guys are all praying for me right now. Amen? <laughs> But that uh, was really, though, my desire. It's like, even though it was painful... Uh, my heart's desire was for him to even see a glimpse of the helicopter, even if it was for one second, because I love him. 
and because I know that he loves helicopters these days. And that's the heart of love. It desires to give. It desires to express love in that way. Because when we love someone, we naturally want to give uh, something to them to really bless them and to minister to their hearts. And this is what marketers are counting on uh, for these holidays, like Christmas or Valentine's Day, and even in Korea, uh, you know, White Day, Black Day, all that stuff like that, right? Uh, because they know that love desires to give to the beloved. And God does that as well. And God so loved the world that he gave his son. And God loves his children, and therefore he gives his children many gifts. And there are three important gifts that God gives to all of his children that we want to uh, look at right now. And the first is the gift of eternal life. When we trust in the saving work of Jesus Christ and surrender our lives under his lordship, he gives <clears throat> to us the precious gift of eternal life with him. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And through that, we become a part of his eternal family forever. So that's one gift that he gives to all of his children. A second gift that God gives to uh, his children is the gift of the Holy Spirit. As proof of our membership into his family and as a seal of our redemption, God gives his Holy Spirit to live inside his children. Uh, so when the Father sees us, he sees the seal of the Spirit and proof that we belong to him within us. And his Spirit in us is also proof that he will never leave us nor forsake us, but will be with us forever. And that's another beautiful promise that comes with the gift of his Spirit. And the third gift that God gives to all of his children are spiritual gifts. And he gives us uh, eternal life, his spirit, and with the spirit also comes spiritual gifts. Now, a spiritual gift is basically just an ability given by the grace of God to serve, uh, empowered by the spirit, in order to build up and serve the body of Christ here on earth. And these gifts are given to his children so that we might serve him and be a blessing for uh, his bride as well. And so these gifts are all given by grace freely. We do not earn it or deserve it, but they are an expression of love that God gives to his children. Uh, and what we want to look at today is the value that we uphold in that third gift, the gift, the spiritual gifts that he gives to us in order to serve, bless, and build up his church. Now, we're in our final few weeks of a series that we've been going through on the core values of OEM. And we want to look at the role of service and ministry in OEM today. Uh, but to review, here are the earlier core values that we've been looking at. Because at OEM, we value Christ and his gospel as everything. We value opportunities to honor his presence. We value reaching the unreached in order to finish the mission. We value excellence in all things. We value viewing the vulnerable as valuable and precious to the heart of God, which is why we pursue justice and mercy and compassion in these arenas of vulnerability. We value aligning all things with Scripture. And last week, we looked at the value of love as the motive of all things. And today's value is this. We value using our gifts to bless the body of Christ. So let's all say this together. Ready? Repeat. We value using our gifts to bless the body of Jesus Christ. All right, so that's what we want to look at today. This value that is given to the church and all of the believers in Christ so that we might be a blessing with the blessings that God has given to us. And so uh, there's a few key things that I want to explore. And so open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 1 to 8 today. Uh, and through this passage, we want to understand the value that we play in being used uh, through the Spirit of God in this ministry. So how do we value uh, and utilize these gifts that God has given to us in a way that God intends, intended? First of all, the first thing that we learn in our passage today is that we need to surrender your life completely. So everybody repeat, surrender your life completely. All right, so that's where we need to begin. Uh, for the life of discipleship, it begins with a heart of surrender. 
And so we need to begin in order to really be the blessing that God intended us to be in this world and in his church, we need to surrender our lives completely to the Lord. Romans chapter 12, starting from verse 1, says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So he begins by appealing to the church, therefore, brothers and sisters, by remembering the mercies of God within your life, that the mercies of God reveal that God does not give us the punishment we deserve. That is mercy. That though we deserve suffering and punishment for our sins, God withholds it by his mercy and his grace. And he says, as we reflect upon the mercies of God, he says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, as a living sign of surrender to the Lord. Give your life fully to the Lord in response to that mercy and grace. And one of the ways that we are called to, as we will see in the uh, following verses in this chapter, is that also this life of surrender to the Lord will be reflected in a life that serves his church. You see, serving is a sign of a surrendered life to God. And this is a crucial principle to understand in your discipleship journey with the Lord. Serving the Lord through his church is a sign of a surrendered life to the Lord. Because God gave you a gift to use. And those gifts are given by God and are to be used to build up and bless the body of Christ. So you have been given, when you become a believer, again, you are given the gift of eternal life, you are given the gift of the Holy Spirit in you, and with the Spirit, you also receive the gifts of the Spirit in various forms. And the reason why God has given you those gifts is not for your own personal selfish pleasures and enjoyment, well, that's fine, but it is ultimately given so that through you, you become a gift to the church. By building the church up, blessing it, strengthening it through your service. And that is one of the reasons why God saved you. A primary reason why God saved you is that he might use you in the service of his kingdom. So, those who do use their gifts show that their joyful obedience comes from a surrendered life. Trusting in Christ for salvation is not the end of the Christian life. It is the beginning. You see, for too many, they get their fire insurance from hell. That, okay, I'm saved. I'm not going to hell anymore. I got fire insurance. And then they live their lives the way that they want by themselves. But serving is a sign of of a surrendered life to the Lord. It is saying, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for these gifts you've given to me. I gladly accept your assignment in my life and serve you and your bride, your beautiful bride that you love, that you died for, your bride, the church. I gladly serve the church for all my days. Why? Because we love you, Jesus, and we love the things that you love. And he loves the church. Amen? And so that's where we need to begin. And this is a crucial foundational truth that you need to understand for the Christian life. That it begins with surrendering your life completely to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Say, God, my life is yours. You have laid down your life for me through your son. You have shed the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And through that shedding of the blood, you have purchased me for all of eternity. I belong to you. I am gladly yours, and I gladly serve you. Not to pay back anything as if we could, not to dishonor the sacrifice of Jesus. We serve the Lord out of joy, out of response, of love, as we looked at last week, out of love as the motive of all that we do. Amen? And you see, that response is crucial for, un for us to understand. Because when we are surrendered to the Lord, that surrendered heart gladly serves the Lord. Serving is a sign 
of a surrendered life. Now, that's where we need to begin, with surrender. And then, uh, the next thing that he outlines for us in this chapter is that we are next called to live with an attitude of humility. So everyone repeat, live with an attitude of humility. All right, so it begins, surrender your life completely and then live with an attitude of humility. Let's look at uh, chapter 12 of Romans, verses, verse 3. It says, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So this humility comes from an understanding of reality. True reality, when we understand it, true reality will lead to humility. What do I mean? When we understand the reality of who God really is, that he is loving, kind, and good, the reality of who we really are, sinners deserving nothing but suffering and hell for rebelling against the holy God, and humility comes from an understanding of the reality that though I deserve no good thing, God has been only good to me. So we need to begin with humility when using our spiritual gifts. Why? Because the distribution of these gifts are all by God's doing, by His grace. He chooses which gifts we're going to get, not us. So we shouldn't get prideful concerning our gifts because God has given them. And certain gifts are not better than others. They are all grace. You see, the early church had this problem of comparing. Uh, some saying, I could speak in tongues, and you can't. I can prophesy, and you can't. Well, I can heal. I can move mountains. Right? So there was this competition going on, and it was dividing the church. And then Paul was rebuking them and saying, hey, you're missing the whole point of why God gave you gifts. First of all, it is God who gave them to you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. It is his choice, his grace. And the reason why he gave it to you is so that you might bless the church with it, not divide the church with it. You see, 1 Corinthians 12, 18 says, but as, as it is, God arranged the members of the body each one as he chose them. He chose each of you, and he chose the gifts to give to each of you. And so this leaves no room for pride. And what happens uh, when we understand this reality is we will grow also in humility. It says, for by the grace given to me, it begins by understanding the reality that we are all sinners who have received much undeserved grace. Because a basic understanding of grace is gift. Something we did not earn or deserve, but is given freely by the one who is generous and gracious. And it is the giver of gifts who receives glory. Not the one who receives the gift, it is the giver who receives the glory. And in the reality of grace in our lives, we remember that God is the giver of all good gifts in our lives. And so God deserves the glory. The only thing we deserve because of our sin is to suffer a miserable life here on earth, die, and then to suffer a miserable life in all of eternity in hell. That is the one thing we truly deserve. So you need to be careful whenever you demand, give me what I deserve. Because that really, in essence, is the only thing we deserve. All that we have and all that we are able to do beyond that is gifts. It is grace. Our intellect, did you do anything before you were born to earn your intellectual capacity? No. That is grace. That is gift. Every talent, skill, ability, that is gift. That is grace. Our ability to walk, which I'm finding now, now that it's taken away from me. Our ability to walk, talk, comprehend, even breathe, that is grace. Every good thing in your life that you enjoy and that blesses you is gift. I want you to put your, uh, feel your pulse for uh, several moments with me, all right? So I know some of you have thicker skin than others, so uh, I'll wait till you guys can feel your pulse, all right? So you feel that? One of the things that you need to understand is that every heartbeat of your pulse, that is gift from God. Gift, 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 gift. Grace, 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 grace. Because we do nothing to earn or deserve the amazing miracle of God being able to sustain every heartbeat of us. 
That is grace. We are sustained by grace every moment of our lives. Amen? That is reality, and it is true reality that will lead to humility. You see, it's when we forget this truth and think, this life is mine, this money is mine, I earned it, I deserve it, these skills, I did it. That attitude will drive away humility very rapidly. You see, the modern-day concept of a self-made woman or a self-made man is actually complete deception. No one is self-made. We are all God-made and God-blessed. Amen? It is grace. That is why verse 3 says of Romans 12, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So verse 1, he says, By the mercies of God, remember the mercies of God, that though we are sinners, fallen and deserving nothing but suffering in hell, remember the mercies of God that, that, that is lavishing over your life. And then he says, remember the grace of God that God has given to you. He says, don't think of yourself higher than this reality, but see your life with sober judgment. And that is connected with our faith in God. Again, true humility is at the heart of true faith. Faith to believe that I'm a sinner condemned to die in need of Jesus to rescue me, that takes humility. Faith to believe that everything that I have is a gift from God so that I receive it with joy, that takes humility. Faith to believe that gifts God has given to me are to be used for the glory of God and for the blessing of his people, that takes humility. So using our gifts is an overflow of humility because the heart of faith will say, wow, God has given me this gift of hospitality. People feel at home when they come over, so God must want me to use that gift to bless the believing body here. So it's an honor to use the gift that I did not deserve, to bring glory to God and bless others in the process, and it is an honor to be used by God to be that blessing. You see, it is not humility or modesty to say, I don't have a gift, or I can't serve, or, you know, because I don't have the gift of singing or leadership, or I can't be in public, you know, I don't have a role to play here. That attitude is both inaccurate and dishonoring to what God has given to you. You know, there was a guy that I knew in college, uh, we'll just call his name Phil, and uh, he would say that he had the gift of no gift. Uh, you know, uh, he was like, I, I have no gift from God for some reason, and he really believed it. And somehow he got onto the praise team, uh, even though he couldn't sing or play an instrument, and so they put him on the bass guitar. Now, no offense to those who play bass. Um, but the thing is, whenever he was playing bass guitar, you would never hear it. Uh, because he would turn the volume down to zero on his instrument. And so the leader found out one time, and so he kind of rebuked Phil and said, hey, you have to keep the volume on, and he told the, uh, the mixing guy, make sure that you don't turn it down either. And Phil would be like, you know, but I can't play. And I was like, just, okay, God can use you. And so uh, he was very fearful because, again, he really could not play. And so he solved this problem by uh, when the volume was up, he would just pretend like he's getting blessed by this thing. He's, he has the guitar, but he's... Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes. And he would be like that throughout the whole praise set. <laughs> and, um, you know, but what I realized getting to know him is that um, I think he had the gift of encouragement. Because whenever people felt the same way as Phil, like, oh, man, God didn't give me any gifts. I can't do anything. After they would meet with Phil, they're like, I think I have some gifts. <laughs> they're like, they're like, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as I thought I was, you know? So he may not have realized it, but he had the gift of encouragement, you know? Um, because God has given all of his children gifts, uh, whether you have realized it or not. And one gift is not better than you know, another. Just because more people can see one gift in a certain person than your gifts that maybe serve behind the scenes, that is not better than the other. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21 and following says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. 
And on the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we, still, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Every part of the body is important. Amen? And one of the things that I was really encouraged by through these verses is that you need to remember that God is fair. Amen? God is fair. And so if there are people who have gifts that are praised in public, be it praise team, leadership, whatever it may be, and you're like, oh man, you know, when I serve, nobody sees that I'm serving. I prepare, I clean up, I set up all these things, and I don't get any, you know, praise or applause or admiration from people. Remember, God is fair. If there are people who have a lot of public gifts and get a lot of praise and accolades here on this earth, I really believe those who served in secret, those who served without the applause of people, will get greater honor in heaven. There will be even greater reward, I believe. Why? Because God is fair. And what he is revealing in his word here is that those parts that we see as unpresentable, that are, we treat with greater modesty, those that we think, parts of our bodies that do not uh, you know, require that public applause, God will give greater honor to the parts that lacked the applause. Amen? So that it should encourage you, regardless of whether people know about what you have done or not, God knows. And when you use that gift that God has given to you, God will honor you for that. Every part of the body is important. It takes faith to believe it, and it takes humility to live it out. And, the, and humility means that you know it's not about you. So everybody repeat, it's not about me. All right, so if you're like, hey, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, I'm so shy, I don't know, God, yeah, God gave me the gift of speaking, but I'm so shy in front of, it's not about you. If God gave you that gift, use it for his glory. Amen? It's not about you. So don't make it about a self-conscious decision whether to serve. If God gifted you gracefully and with humility, use that. It is about him. It is about Jesus. His gift to be used for his glory, to bless his people, and to build his kingdom. That's what it means to live with an attitude of humility, that it is for God and not about me. So, these are the principles and the building blocks that we're building upon here. So it begins with a true life of discipleship that understands the value of service and ministry. It begins when we surrender your life completely. It begins there. You say, God, you are Lord. You call the shots. I follow you. You've called me to serve, so I will serve. That's what lordship means. So you've given me gifts to use, and now I'm going to use it. So it begins with a surrendered life. We surrender your life completely. And also it means that in our hearts, we live with an attitude of humility. So those are two important building blocks that we need to begin with. Surrender completely and the heartbeat of humility. And then we are able to serve within our ministry. So everybody repeat, serve within your ministry. Right, so surrender your life completely, live with an attitude of humility, and then serve within your ministry in that order. Right, because you do have a ministry assignment from God. Our gifts are not for us to, to enjoy by ourselves for ourselves. Our gifts are given for the greater body of Christ. Our gifts are to be used for the unity and the blessing of the whole body of Christ. Everything in your life is to be done for the glory of God and the good of your fellow man and woman next to you. Another way of saying it, out of love for God and out of love for one another. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. So there is a purpose and a plan as to why God gifted you the way that he did. 
He gave you a gift so that you'll use it to strengthen the body here. So we must not bury our gifts or neglect them. Rather, we are to use them for their intended purpose. We need to remember that we have equal value, but different functions in the body of Christ. Again, one person is not more valuable. One gift is not more valuable. Equal value, but different functions within the body of Christ. But your gifting will usually determine your role within the church. And I do want to emphasize usually. So those with the gift of leadership should lead. Those with the gift of teaching should teach. Those gifted in hospitality should welcome others. Uh, those who have a heart and a vision and the energy for youth and children should serve in our children's and youth ministries. If you could keep up with them still, I think you're gifted for that ministry. <laughs> Uh, those gifted in media should offer their services to the media ministry. And when we operate within our giftings, God is pleased, we're happier, more fulfilled, and people will also be blessed. But when people do not operate in their gifting, there will usually be frustration on everybody's part. Because when, if you're gifted in leadership and you've been under people uh, leading who are not gifted in leadership, there's usually going to be a lot of frustration. Uh, but when we are operating within our gifting, that is a way for us to really flourish and function as God intended. But an important footnote that I want to make in light of that here is to remember why we mentioned the previous point, and that is to use and to serve with, uh, with a heart of humility. Because more than ability, it is the attitude of the heart that matters more to God. Because you may be gifted, as a leader, but if all of a sudden you're carrying around that weight, say, hey man, I'm, I'm a leader, you should make me lead, you should follow me. That attitude is a greater disservice to the body of Christ than not using the gift. So you may be gifted, but the gift that is used with arrogance will cause greater damage to the body of Christ. So though in principle we are to serve within our area of giftings, the greater priority is a heart of humility and surrender to the Lord that seeks to be a blessing to his people. Amen? That is far more important to the kingdom of God. Uh, so the attitude that we want to have in OEM is, yes, as much as possible, we want to help people serve in their area of gifting and passions, and that's how it should be, but that also needs to come with great humility and maturity and character as well, because the Bible also is clear that if you have young believers who are not yet strong in their faith yet, if they are recent converts, do not put them into places of public leadership because too much temptation by the enemy will allow the pride to lead to a fall. And so there's wisdom principles that we need to also follow that has a higher priority upon character, humility, and the heart attitude. And so that's what we want to follow as well. So... While our aim is to use our gifts, uh, we also desire to make sure that the heart attitude is a higher priority of why we do these things to the Lord. You know, um, one of the things that being on crutches has really taught me, uh, especially in light of our message for today, is when certain muscles get overused, uh, there's a lot of things that kind of get messed up in your body, you know? Uh, because I haven't been able to use my left foot uh, properly for the past week, um, I'm majorly working my shoulders. And the shoulders are getting strong, but I also like, hear my shoulders complaining like, what are you guys doing down there? I could use some help here, right? Because uh, it gets really tired really easily. Uh, and unfortunately, the left leg, because it's not being used as often, is not getting as strong. You know, I had a friend in Australia... Uh, he was a mega bodybuilder. And you know, you can tell who bodybuilders are, right? I mean, you just glance like, oh, you like working out, don't you? <laughs> and on the flip side, it's very easy to tell, oh, you don't work out, do you, right? It's very obvious. Right? And he loves working out. And uh, we talked a lot. He was also a firefighter. And so how appropriate, right? Such a manly guy, man, right? Working out and firefighter. Well, anyway, you know what we were talking one time? And uh, we were talking about balance, I think, and somehow we got on the topic of his bodybuilding, and he was stressing it is important to balance 
your upper body workouts with your lower body workouts. And he was stressing the importance of balancing your muscle workouts. Um, now, uh, in light of that, uh, he showed me a picture of a guy that also went to his gym that only worked out his upper body for years without ever balancing his lower body workouts. So after a few years, from the waist up, he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but the waist down, he looked like Hillary Clinton. <laughs> now, no offense to Hillary Clinton, supporters of, and actually, I've never even seen her legs, so I can't really say for certain, but you guys kind of get the idea. It was a strange sight to behold because his arms were bigger than his legs. And that was weird. <laughs> now, why did that happen? Because a few muscles were overworked while the rest of his body did not get a workout at all. But sadly, that weird image is the same picture for a lot of churches today is that there are certain parts of the body, certain members of the body of Christ that is serving faithfully, working out and getting huge and strong and tired at times, getting big while other parts of the body have never gotten a proper workout. And so we have this very peculiar shaped body of Christ. Arnold Schwarzenegger, Hillary Clinton, all right? And it's a stat far too common in the churches today, which I hope will change for OEM, but that in most churches, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. That's not healthy, that's not right, and that is not God-honoring as God intended. You see, if you do not use your gifts, the whole body will be weakened. We may function, but we will not flourish as God intended until all the parts of the body do what God calls it to do. Amen? This ministry will be transformed if each one of us did what God called us to do. You know, uh, I grew up in Chicago in the Midwest, and though I grew up in the suburb areas, if you go a little bit further out, there's a lot of more country farming areas. And uh, when you drive from Chicago City to my university, my University of Illinois, it's surrounded by cornfields. And in the springtime, you could smell it because, you know, there are certain, um, what's the best word to use? Um, you know, okay, manure, all right? That's, that's the best way to say it. There's a lot of manure that just gets spread out and you can just smell it. And when you're driving uh, through some of these country areas, they have uh, county fairs, country fair, county fairs and stuff like that, um, just like in the movies, you know, where they have like, um, you know, eating contest and who raised the biggest pigs, you know, and you win, you know, you have the biggest pig and who raised the biggest, uh, who grew the biggest uh, tomatoes, you know, they have a lot of these very peculiar contests. And in this one um, town, in this co country fair, they had a horse pulling contest uh, because that's what they like to do, you know. <laughs> and uh, the first place prize of the horse, he was, this horse was able to pull 4,500 pounds worth of stuff. Second place uh, pulled 4,000 pounds worth of stuff. And that's pretty substantial. 4,500 pounds of anything is pretty substantial. Uh, but the two winners of first and second place, they decided, hey, let's see how much our horses can pull if they pull together. And so the 4,500 and the 4,000 horse joined forces to pull, and they together were able to pull 12,000 pounds worth of stuff. And that was fascinating to see, that the synergy effects that happens through teamwork when we serve together. And I really believe that that is not just for a, a picture or a symbolical notion that is a reality that, that God has created within all of creation. Is that when we learn that we were not created to be isolated individual by, our, by ourselves, but we were created for community, which we'll look at next week more fully. But when we realize that when we learn to serve each other and serve together, there will be a far greater effectiveness for the kingdom of God that will happen through the church. Amen? And so that is why we need to learn and understand that we are here for a reason, to serve and strengthen the body of Christ. 
Our ministry will grow stronger and flourish when we each do our parts. So use your gift humbly for the glory of God and for the strengthening of this ministry. 1 Peter 4.10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So each of you here should use your gifts as God has given you to serve the body of Christ faithfully. That is why he says in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 and following, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. So use your gifts. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service, then serve. If one who teaches, then teach. If one who exhorts, in his exhortation. If one who contributes, give generously. To the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So use your gifts faithfully doing your part within the church's mission. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 also says, So it is with you, since you are eager for gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those especially that build up the church. So God blessed us with gifts to build up the church here. So seek to be faithful in them. And that is why we offer the SHAPE course, which will be happening pretty soon. And so if you don't know how you're gifted or how you're shaped, I encourage you to go through this class, uh, sign up for it today, and discover in this course, how God wired you in your own unique shape, because we all have our own unique shape. And what shape stands for is spiritual gifts, uh, hearts, passions, abilities, natural talents, personality, because we need all the different personalities, introverts, introverts, extroverts, thinkers, feelers, and experiences. Even our own unique experiences make us who we are. Rick Warren says, God never wastes the hurts. And especially in the difficult things that we've gone through in our lives, uh, that pain can become a source of healing and blessing to others. Your deepest pain can be redeemed to become your deepest ministry by the grace of God. So use your shape to faithfully serve the Lord here at OEM. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, there's an important story uh, that Jesus tells about the parable of the talents. A man... Uh, gives a servant five talents. That servant invests it, uses it, develops it, gains five more when he sees his master. Uh, there's another man, he gave two talents. He also used it, invested it, developed it, gained two more. And to both of these people, the master says, well done, good and faithful servants. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. But there's one servant he gave one talent, and he did nothing with it. He buried it. He neglected it. And then when the master returned, he just gave it back. He said, you gave this to me? Here, here it's right back at you. To this person, very interesting thing what Jesus says about this person. Matthew 25, 30, he says, Cast this worthless servant into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Fascinating and frightening language that Jesus uses here for this person. The same language that Jesus uses throughout the Gospels in reference to hell. Now, I'm not saying, oh, if you don't serve, God's going to send you to hell. Okay, I'm not saying that. And it's not saying you have to serve in order to be saved. Rather, what it is saying is that those who are truly saved will joyfully have a desire to serve. Another way of saying it is the first principle we are looking at in the first point for today is that serving is a sign of a surrendered life to God. Jesus tells us this story to remind us that one day we're all going to stand before God and we will need to answer this question. When God would ask, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with the gifts that I gave you when you became a believer? I gave you these gifts so that you might be a blessing, so that you might be a gift to my church, to my bride, whom I love, whom I died for. What did you do with it? And that's an important question that we need to ask ourselves as well. God has gifted you because he wants to use you to bless others. And in his graciousness and goodness, he gifted you because he wants to reward you in heaven for the way that you use those gifts. And that too is an honor. 
You know, these days, um, I'm sorry that I, I like to talk about my son Enoch a lot, but I'm going to begin and end today with a story about him. Um, Enoch has a really good memory these days, especially, you know, I told you that he's really into toy cars, like matchbox cars. Uh, he, when he first receives a matchbox car, he will ask, what kind of car is it? You can, yeah, like, what is this? And then we have to tell him the make and the model. It's like, this is, this is Audi, Audi. So he says, oh, Audi. This is BMW, BMW. He has very expensive taste in cars, okay? Um, but I gave him a Hyundai because we're driving. I said, oh, daddy's car. You know, he's like this. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's how he will refer to all of his cars now. He will call them. He's like, where's my Porsche? You know, uh, because somebody recently gave him a Porsche uh, car, toy car, okay? <laughs> so where's my Porsche? Where's my Porsche? And so that's his newest favorite car. So we have to make sure we always know where it is because he can't go to sleep. He can't go to the car. He can't come out of the car without his new favorite car, toy. It used to be daddy's Hyundai, but not anymore. <laughs> he, he got over that really quickly. But, anyway. uh, but also what he does is he connects. If someone gave him that gift, he connects it with the person that he gave it. So he will say, oh, this is daddy's gift or this is mommy's gift to me. Or this is, you know, whoever the name of the person was. So this is, uh, you know, this person's gift. And so he'll say, oh, this is Porsche, and this is Mimi's gift. Like, Mimi gave it to him. And so, where's Mimi's gift? Where's the Porsche? And so we always make these connections. And so, you know, also recently my wife gave him a new soccer ball because he lost his previous soccer ball. And so he will not only call it soccer ball, he will say, Mommy's gift. Mommy's gift to me. And when he tell, shows people... Uh, the gift that I gave to him. Say, this is daddy's gift. He'll show, you know, our gram, uh, his grandmother or grandfather will come over. He'll show them, this is daddy's gift to me. Even though it's a Hyundai. <laughs> you know, it feels so good when he acknowledges who gave him that gift. Again, it is because the giver receives glory when the humble person will give the credit. And I love it not just when he acknowledges my gifts, I love it when he plays with my gift. When he still has mercy and plays with the Hyundai again, you know? I love when he plays with my gifts. Why? Because I gave him that gift out of love to bless him and for him to enjoy it and to be blessed by it. See, and I really believe that the feeling that I sense is the same feeling of God in heaven, our Father in heaven. He feels the same way when we, his children, acknowledge his gifts in our lives, that this is from the Lord, that I have this ability from the Lord. This is from you, God. And not only do we acknowledge that this gift is from our Father in heaven, when we use it and enjoy it as God intended, I believe that delights the heart of God. Amen? And that is why God has gifted you, so that you can be a gift and be a blessing to the church, even here, even now, and when you use it with joy, when you use it faithfully, he does it so that he can reward you as well for all of eternity because that is the kind of good father we have in heaven. That is our good God who only gives good gifts to his children. Amen? Let's pray.